But anyway, here we are. Nice to see you. And um, great charity. Lovely to support CLL support. They've been phenomenally uh, well, wonderful over many years and very helpful in the last couple of years on our research program. So thank you very much. So I think I was told to talk about this CLL in 2022-3. That was the title I was given. So looking for, you're looking to next year already, <laughs> which is a good sign. Um, but let's talk mainly about 22. Introduction to CLL. We'll talk about active monitoring, first line, second line, and future treatments. And I'll try and um, you know, try and make things accessible, and which is actually how I like to think it helps me. So hematologists always have to show a blood film, don't they? Leukemia. I was in Greece. I was in Cyprus actually three weeks ago. Didn't go to Greece too often. Anyone speak Greek? Leukemia. What does it mean? Yeah. Greek, white blood. I tell all the students that. Nice way to remember it, actually. These simple things make a difference. White blood. There you are, there's the blood film. Uh, there's not actually not many on there, but these are the white cells. You forget all those red cells. You've got a thousand times more of those. They're carrying oxygen around your blood, keeping you alive with oxygen. But um, these are too many white cells. Leukemia, that's where the word comes from. And they're lymphocytes, so that's where the lymphoid comes from. And the chronic, that's because it's generally a chronic disease and goes on for many years, as you said. Change that. I don't know why it says 12, 2012. I gave a talk for you in 2012, 12, and I was looking back at some of the old slides. It remains the most common type of leukemia. And as you know, a lot of, a lot of cases. Um, this is really, t I was, I was going to take this out because I, I struggle to remember this. I don't think you need to know all of this. This is the details of the type of cell, the lymphocyte. CD5, you might remember that, is, is a particular marker. If you don't have many in your blood, we, not white blood, we call it something different. Monoclonal B-cell lymphocytosis, I don't know if anyone has that condition. It's like an early stage condition. Average age of diagnosis, 72. So in a disease of older people, it's said that 10%, less than 50. You do see it occasionally, but not that often. More common in men. Yeah, I don't think we really understand that. Um, probably genetic. We do the Y chromosome, perhaps. And there is a genetic predisposition, I think. It slightly runs in families, which is unusual for cancer in general, actually. Um, so there's an increased risk in first degree relatives, parents, children. But it, I mean, the risk is still very small because CLL is a rare condition, an uncommon condition. So it's not a high risk uh, compared to some of the big tumours, breast cancer. You know, the risk generally in women is like one in eleven or something. So I don't think we need to be too worried for the family, but there is that slight increased risk. And again, probably something to do with the genes that you inherited. So what about these B cells? I mean, you've got, we all have B cells. They've been incredibly important for the last two, three years. Haven't they? They, they make antibodies and we all have them. But the CLL is, they've acquired genetic damage. I don't know why. Part of life. Um, cells divide, they make mistakes, we've got cosmic rays coming down all the time, radium coming up from the ground, radioactivity, it's just damage, and over time these cells have got the capacity that they divide more than normal, They're replicating a bit too much. And also, this is quite important, particularly when you think of venetoclax, some of you are probably taking venetoclax, not just that they're dividing more, but they don't die as quickly. They're more prone to stay alive for longer. So they accumulate. And that's why the CLL accumulates over many years. And as you know, when patients are diagnosed, they should also be offered support, the clinical nurse especially. So we try and do that. Hopefully people have that in their clinics now and also literature, including your own, is offered. So what do we do, um, and what have you been through when we look at the uh, diagnosis of CLL? What do you have done? So this is a slide that looks at when you're initially diagnosed, pre-treatment, before you're going into a treatment, 
staging at the end of a treatment to assess how well it's worked and follow up. And some of these are quite interesting, very practical things to discuss. So obviously, a diagnosis all through people are monitored in clinic, history, physical examination, performance status. That's critical, isn't it? How fit are people? What's their comorbidities? How are they doing? We do the blood counts. Hematologists do blood counts all the time. You can't stop them doing that. That's fine. And we do the biochemistry as well. I don't quite know why this has got a negative here, but it might have been in terms of looking at serum immunoglobulins and whether everybody has those done. Does everyone have those as diagnosis? No, probably not. So, um, patients with CLL, their antibody levels tend to drop over time. And that's interesting, you know, academically, but for you, does it really matter? Only in the, if you're getting infections, yeah? If you're getting a lot of infections, then that becomes important. <coughs> There's no real need to have your immunoglobulins measured at baseline, quite frankly. It's not going to change your management. Um, the direct immunoglobulin test, that's for looking for hemolysis. So I think you, we wouldn't do that. I wouldn't do those, to be honest. You've always got to have one eye on costs of everything in the NHS and in healthcare across the world. So, you know, a, a maxim of doctors generally and patients, I would hope, is that unless it's going to change something, we think twice. So those are, those are first line. Genetics. Looking whether the tumour has got this high risk mutation. I'm going to talk about TP53 in a minute. Again, that's critical when you have treatment. So whenever anybody has treatment, you must look for this genetic mutation. I'll talk about that in a minute. I'll talk about IGHV, immunoglobulin mutation. Anyone understand that? How many people, any confusion about that? Anyone care about that? <laughs> Have you heard of it? Yeah. Uh, yeah. yeah. Complex, isn't it? Okay. I'm going to take you through it. <laughs> <laughs> On a Saturday afternoon. That's quite important, actually. It's quite interesting, at least. Bone marrows. I changed this. I put more negatives in from this slide. I took out interventions. They're not a very nice thing to go through, are they? Again, I don't think we should be doing them unless we really need them. They can be important. We probably overuse them. We have definitely overused CT scans. I put loads of negatives on that line. That's a lot of radiation, the CT scan radiation. And, you know, it's, it's money, it's time. We should only be doing them really if we need them. Yeah? So don't feel undervalued if you've not had lots of CT scans. You have to be asking ourselves why we want them. So, quite a few negatives there. Might be in treatment. I would say you don't even need to in every case of going into treatment. Staging. We don't, you know, we don't do much in staging of CLL. You shouldn't be doing CT scans to see how treatments work. Absolutely unnecessary uh, in the vast majority of cases. And follow-up is, is not needed. I don't know if you want this to be interactive or whether you want me to just talk or... I, I, if anyone has any pressing questions with regard to understanding what Paul is, then fine during it. But maybe leave them to the end. Yeah, because I think yeah. you're recording, you may, you may be a, recording it. page that you can write questions down yeah. if you want an aid memoir. You know, things like CTs and bone marrows and policy is quite interesting, I would think, to patients, to be honest. Those are quite intriguing, important. Right. Immunoglobulin mutation status. All of you could be classified into two groups. Your immunoglobulin genes are either mutated or they're not. And that can influence prognosis. In fact, people would say it does influence prognosis. Um, when I say I'm a little, when I sound a bit ambivalent, it's just in a good way that our treatments are getting so good that these old-fashioned markers are less important now. They're getting less and less important. But it's still quite important. So shall I go through what it is? You know that the tumour is a B-cell, right? Yeah, we've talked about that. Every B-cell has an antibody on its surface. Yeah, It's got this antibody stuck on the top. 
as a CLL is from a single cell originally, it's clone as we call it, that means every CLL tumour cell has got the same antibody on it. Yeah? Stuck on its surface. Now an antibody is coded from a gene in your DNA. You know that. That's sort of rules of biology. Your mum and your dad, a few decades ago, 30 or 40 or a bit more, gave you this gene set and they gave you antibody genes, yeah? And that gene makes that for antibody on the surface. Now then, if the gene that your tumour is using is very similar to the one that your mum and dad gave you a few decades ago, we call that unmutated. Yeah? It has not changed. That makes sense, doesn't it? It's unmutated. It's the original one. But in the development of your B cell, if in the development of a tumour, that gene has changed, that means it has mutated. Yeah? So you've taken your mum and your dad's gene, your antibody gene, and during the development of the tumour, it's changed, it's mutated. So does that explain it? Yeah? So some patients, their tumours are germline, as we call it, right back from your... I keep talking about your parents a lot. We do that as we get older, don't we? But it's very interesting biology, isn't it? Oh, my lot. Good. The genes that they gave them. And some are changed. We don't know why. Now then, this is grey, right? You know, it, there's, a, there's a gradation. It's not like you're clearly in one group and clearly in another, but we've created a cut-off in, in biology, in medicine, and we've sort of sorted people into two groups. It's roughly 50-50. Some of you may know which one you're in. You unmutated have a worse outlook, yeah? Mutated patients have a better outlook. Traditionally, well, I'm trying to, hopefully, we'll come to the conclusion together that we can change this. Now then, some of you may know that status, some may not. The great majority of patients in my clinic, let's say, don't know, because we haven't done it, right? Because it hasn't made much difference. It's, it's been important to scientists, because they've looked into this over the last 10 years and said, gosh, there's a difference now. But again, it only really becomes important when it changes practice of what you're going to treat people with. And it's starting to. Yeah? So now it becomes more important. I'll try and take you through some of that. So here we are. They've even got a little picture of DNA, yeah? There you go, that's supposed to be a double helix. 50% of you in one group, 50% in the other. This was one study, the median survival was different. Only one study, it's historical, and so forth. We're going to come to treatment in a minute. Now, we used to talk, remember that the vast majority of patients, when they're diagnosed, don't need treatment. I'm sure, hopefully... Some of you still on active monitoring. We used to call it watch and wait, right? But the watch and wait is not really used that so much these days because it does imply watching and not doing very much and waiting and not doing. Whereas we, we're slightly more, this is a bit more active, right? It's a bit more of a, we're doing something more dynamic. There's no evidence that treating early before symptoms arise is helpful. In fact, my previous talk that I gave to CLL support had a little clause that said there's evidence that actually makes things worse. I took that out. But yes, if you go back a very long way with chemotherapy, it, it wasn't so good. It may change because our new treatments are so much better that maybe, maybe we could push things earlier, but we'd have to ask why. Now, of course, it can be difficult just saying to people, it's a leukemia, we're calling it white blood or whatever, and we're not going to treat you. But generally, most people, patients are okay when you explain the things. One proviso, and of course the last two years has really brought this into focus, is patients with CLL, the longer they go on, the immune system isn't watching and waiting, it's somewhat deteriorating, yeah? So you could say you're watching the immune system deteriorate a bit, yeah? Antibodies are going down. 
we found that the COVID antibody response was just a little bit worse in people who'd had disease for a longer time. Nevertheless, tradition, you know, we don't treat unless we have to. And so what do we do in active monitoring? Well, I suppose I'll have to talk a little bit about COVID. Isn't it lovely to be here? You know, we never thought we would be here like this right two years ago. Goodness me, last three years. Um, COVID-19 vaccines have transformed the outlook. I think I've got... Yeah. Vaccines have transformed. I'll talk about it in a minute. Patients with blood cancer remain at increased risk. Yes, unfortunately still in increased risk. Um... That's true of all infections, isn't it? I mean, I've given so many talks on COVID in the last two, three years. And it is true that you know, CLL patients are more at risk than other forms of cancer. You know, it's inherent in the disease. Something to do with that B cells and those antibodies. It's not true of other things so much like breast cancer and other things like they don't have that degree of immune suppression. So still some risk, but the risk is transformed down. And, uh, but it remains important. And so what do, we, um, what do we talk about with you these days and what you want to talk about in, in relation to COVID? So we're now up to six vaccines. I ask pretty much every patient who comes in the clinic these days how many vaccines they've had. Some have had six, so hopefully some of you have. I would say it's a minority. <laughs> uh, you know, people have a variety of numbers. Um, but you, know, you should obviously optimise vaccine protection. They've been transformative. Patients have a home test kit. Many of you probably had this where you've got, you know, had a positive COVID test and you went in for antibody treatment or antiviral therapy. And that's been great in the UK, really worked well. Social behaviour as required, of course shielding was, you know, I'm sure many of you went through that, very difficult thing. That's not really required now, but you often get questions reasonably about, do I see my grandchildren, you know, they, and so forth, and all of those difficult questions. Um, but now the risk is greatly reduced. And treatment options, as I'm going to spend the last talk on, because I think you wanted me to talk today more about treatment than infection, is based on what's the best treatment, yeah? Because in previous couple of years, we've been having discussions, what should we give this patient? What's best for their CLL? Well, that antibody is going to make them at risk of COVID. Oh yeah, well perhaps we shouldn't do this. We don't really tend to talk like that now. Now it's more about what's the best treatment against the CLL, yeah? This is good. So things have been transformed. You know that um, the risk in the early days was very high. We led the CLLVR study in Birmingham. We think it's probably the biggest vaccine study in leukemia ever, which is extraordinary. Um, and thanks, CLL support were actually great support in that. And many of you recruited, probably sent, given samples to that. Thanks very, very much. Um, uh, but in this study now, we've got 500 patients. We've got a lot of data on that. We had at least 70 or 80 infections. We didn't notice any deaths in the whole cohort after vaccines, it's in, which is encouraging, isn't it? I'm not to say that there aren't severe infections and not to say that there will be mortality from COVID in patients with CLL. Of course there will, and there is just as there is with influenza and other things. And there is in the general population, yeah? but the risk is markedly, markedly reduced. But while we're at it, we're always looking for something to come from a bad thing, yeah? We, we've got to do that, that's your trait, isn't it? What can we learn from this? And we realized, I mean, I say, I, I, I realize, we never really optimized immune protection in general in CLL, yeah? If we did an audit of all the CLL patients in the country and have they been vaccinated against shingles and pneumococcus and COVID and influenza optimally, not sure what the results would look like. But we can do better, yeah? And the guidelines show that, you know, we should be optimizing vaccines against pneumococcus. And we should be making sure that people get the Shingrix vaccine that's come out. 
between the age of 70 and 79. It's killed, it's safe, it's effective. So this is things that we need to do. And people are talking now about a CLL passport for immunization. Anyone come across those? Or anyone got one, like a little passport? Say what vaccines you've had and so forth. So this is an innovation that's come from this last two years, which will help. It will save lives and a lot of morbidity. So that's one thing that's happening. Right. That's active monitoring, infection, infection through all. What about if you want to have, if you have to have treatment? Why do we start treatment? People with swollen lymph nodes, you know, bulky lymph nodes, maybe a big spleen that's painful or uncomfortable. This is probably the main one I see. Anemia, low platelet counts. The good cells being squeezed out occasionally weight loss, so forth. That's not so common. So those are the indications. Basically, what we have is chemotherapy, immunotherapy, brutantyrosine kinase inhibitors, I brutinib, I calibrutinib, I spelt wrong, sorry, um, and venetoclax. Those are the things we have. How do we use them? Well, it's good that we had in 2022, it's good job I didn't come a year ago, because this year we've had the British Com Committee for Standards and Hematology Guidelines. Has anyone looked at this? Yeah. It's tough, isn't it? <laughs> yeah. Really hard. I'm not on the committee, but it's quite hard to get through, actually. It's very useful. A lot of thoughts got into it. I'm very grateful. Um, so we're going to work our way through this today, yeah? We're going for that. Right, well, let's start at the top then. Um, treatment needed. No. Continue oh, watching waste. Look at that script in. Active monitoring. Um, treatment needed. Yes. Screen for TP53 and mutational status. You see, they put it in right at the top. Now, the, if somebody came in now and did a little test in this room and talked about IGH mutation, you'd all know, right? I'd expect very good results. <laughs> but let's talk about TP53. Here you are. We're back to your parents again. You've got 20,000 genes. Did you know that, roughly? We used to think it'd be 100,000. We got very disappointed. It's only 20. <laughs> Um, 20 from your mum, 20 from your dad, they all come together and sort of mix them. Every cell has the same number of genes. Now, out of those, there is one gene, one, called TP53 that's important, particularly in CLL, and it makes a protein called P53. And um, you might say, if you've got 20,000, couldn't evolution have put a few more in this box? Why are we relying on one? <laughs> it's a very interesting story. Um, probably because this gene... Evolution, by the way, is perfect. So it's got it right. Why has it got it right? Well, this is a very powerful gene. It stops your cells dying. But if you've got too many of them, it makes you age at a rate of knots, probably. Uh, you, so you've got to get the balance right. Anyway, this is the gene. And it's very important in making sure that when a cell is damaged... When you get your cosmic rays that I've talked about and your radium coming up and it damages a cell, it dies. Yeah? It has that sensible, isn't it? It's damaged. P53 is needed to make that happen. Now, in many, many cancers, all cancers, <coughs> lung, colon, this is damaged. Most, most cancers yeah, have a damage in P53. It's mad. Yeah? Evolutionary, it's such an important gene, and it's true of CLL as well. So often in CLL, this gene is inactivated. That means that the cells are not so good at dying, and it means that chemotherapy doesn't work. It really shouldn't be used, yeah? That's what the PTP53 gene is. This is a slide from, uh, I think it's a recent AZ meeting. And um, it's quite nice because it's a cartoon of chromosome, right? Yeah. How many pairs of those have you got? 
I won't talk about those parents again. We talked about them. How many pairs did they give you? Twenty-three pairs. Yeah, twenty-two plus your sex chromosomes, X and Y. And there's the chromosome. That's normal. Nice clean pair. And this one, look, it's got a bit missing. That's called a deletion. Many of you had fish tests. Yeah. Fish tests for TP53 are looking for this missing bit. It's gone. It's down. That's one reason you can get resistant to it. This is where it's mutated. So it's still there, but it's damaged. And you can get both as well. Anyway, so before you have treatment for CLL, you should always have a TP53 test. On blood is fine, because there's tumor cells in the blood. And they also want you now to have a mutational status. Right. Ready for the next stage. Consider comorbidities. Patient preference, you see? You're in there. You came to you came last, but you're in there. Comorbidities, other medication, patient preference, and then clinical trials. So it's good to do clinical trials. None of this is based on anything without clinical trials. I'm sure many of you have done clinical trials. Then we're on to treatment, <coughs> patient group. This is first line therapy, this is first line treatment. What percentage of people do you think might have a TP53 mutation? What guess? Kind of low, 5%, 10% at most. So those are in this group. But disrupted, most people will still have a normal TP53. So they're in here. So let's look at this here. TP53 is intact, no comorbidities, fit and healthy. Mutated, remember your immunoglobulin gene is mutated and potentially suitable for chemotherapy. So you're in this group. So this is complex. But, let's go back a bit. I gave you the options of chemotherapy, BTKIs, venetoclax. It's very hard to find any CLL doctor that I speak to who's used any chemotherapy in CLL for years. I don't know if many of you have had chemotherapy recently, in the last three or four years. It's not very much used at all, so two or three years for sure. Why is that? Because it's got a very, very restricted place now. It's in particularly younger people who have a mutated gene, which is 50%, remember, they may be candidates for FCR, fludarabine, cyclophosphamide, rituximab. Now, FCR has been a very, very good treatment. This is the evidence from FCR, actually. And what it found is that you've seen lots of these Kaplan-Myers charts. I, pri I should pride myself on not showing too many of these, because all hematologists, their whole talk is drenched in Kaplan-Myers curves, right? But anyway, everyone stops up here, and, and then they, we drift down, don't we, over time? And and this is FCR data, and you see this mutation gene thing has come out, yeah, now, these two groups. Remember, unmutated, more like your mum and dad, they're not doing so well, progressing more. But the mutated ones, where they're hemoglobin gene, you see how they're doing better. And hematologists have got very excited about this, because that line there, they, it has that famous P word that we use a lot, plateau. And plateau means potentially a cure, right? So, does there, is there a case for patients who can tolerate chemo, i.e. young, and are mutated to have chemotherapy? And that remains a live debate, yeah? Because this is at six months and then cure, right? No more. So, that's the good. The bad is that there are side effects of chemotherapy, you know, infections, of course, and potentially later damage in a small percentage, of, yeah. very small percentage of patients, myelodysplasia, damaged, mutated bone marrow. And therefore, even this group now, 
is generally not having chemotherapy because we're tending to give this combination of venetoclax on a binutuzumab, which is, I'll come across, I'll ex explain that in a minute. Um, but that is a very, very good combination. And in the UK, by the way, our access to drugs is very good. You know, in COVID times, I was on calls with people in the EU and all this. Oh, we can't use that. Yeah? We've got good access. And so VO is used in people who are young and are still mutated and is generally preferred. But we can talk about this in our discussion section. Now then, most people probably fall into this group because they are unsuitable for chemotherapy. You wouldn't want to go through this chemotherapy if you're, you know, you're above, you know, in your 60s or any comorbidity. And so here, this is a very, very large group of people. That the P53 is intact. It's fine, 90% will be, but they're not fit for treatment. And then you're on to these two big drugs, two big classes of drugs. The BTK inhibitors and venetoclax. I think I had a slide on the mechanism of action of these drugs, but it doesn't seem to be in there. But you probably know about these drugs, so let me explain them. So um, I've talked a lot about this B cell, haven't I? And I've said it's got an antibody on its surface. That antibody is not redundant. It's still doing th something. And what it's doing is it's looking for signals to survive. Actually, the tumor that we have may actually be, might even be reacting against your body in some way. But it's seeking out signals to keep it alive. And it transmits those signals from the antibody into the cell to keep it alive. And when it does that, it uses a protein. Yeah? And that protein is called BTK. Very interesting story why it's called Bruton tyrosine kinase. But I don't think we've got time for that. <laughs> but the drug that was developed stops BTK working. So now we have a tumor cell. It's still got its antibody there. The antibody's still seeing something and it's it's trying to signal to the cell to divide and survive, and it can't. And that is why these BTK drugs are so good. Abrutinib was the first one. I'll show you a little bit of data on abrutinib. Acalabrutinib is the sort of, I wouldn't call it next generation. I think it's quite that different, but it's got slightly different side effects. It's widely used. Its access is more easy and so forth. But these are both very, very good drugs. Venetoclax is another very, very interesting super, super drug. And this works by a very different mechanism. So when we got our CLL tumor cell with this antibody on the surface, the antibody signaling away, that's fine. Not, not directed in that pathway. But the other thing about the CLL cell, the CLL tumor cell, is it's pumped up with a protein called BCL2. And what this protein does is it stops the cell dying. Yeah? I told you at the start, you tend to think of a cancer dividing like mad, yeah? That's what I think of a cancer, you know, dividing like mad. The CLL tumor it divides a bit more, but what it doesn't do is it doesn't die enough. Cells die, they turn over. But the CLL tumor is pumped up with BCL2 protein, and this drug, venetoclax, kills off that protein. So suddenly the CLL starts to die. Talk about in a minute how dramatic that can be. So we have a war, we have a battle going on in, in CLL now. Clinically, pragmatically, financially, if you run these companies. This is huge business. This is massive. Venetoclax versus BTKI. They're both brilliant. You can hardly put a piece of paper between them in first-line therapy, is my view. Let's look at some data on acalabrutinib now. 
complex slide, but this is chemotherapy, which we don't use. The green is a calibrutinib. Twice a day, how does it do? This is progression-free survival. We're out to five years. First line, remember. This is chemotherapy. Gosh, it's poor, isn't it, sadly? But we shifted a lot of that in the time. But, yeah, disappointing. Um, and this is 72%. I've not progressed. Five years. Say calibrutinib. Very good. Good BTKI data, first line. Overall survival, as you know, in CL trials, very different to separate them for two reasons. One is because survival is very good in CLL, which is great. And the other thing that in these trials, what happens, as you know, is that when somebody progresses on this, because they're in the study, right, we say they switch to the other drug, right? So you get it, and they survive, thankfully, and so forth. So that's, it, it's messy. It doesn't, they can't judge it. Side effects. And these become important because we have important these great drugs. Now side effects become important. What do we see? A bit of diarrhea. This is basically chemo versus BTK. A bit more diarrhea. I've not seen that as a big issue so much. Headache is an important one with people who are now the brutinib. You can see 39% got a headache compared to 11% on chemo. Apparently People say take caffeine drinks. I don't know if anyone's done that. Take tea, coffee with these. Headaches. They generally wear off. They're not bad at all. It's not a major side effect, I'm told. Um, arthralgia has been a problem with BTKI drugs. And you can see a quarter there. Neutropenia, it's not too bad. Um, when you think of BTKIs, one of their side effects is cardiac problems, heart and atrial fibrillation is increased even with a calibrutinib. 0.6 in that group, 7% in that group. So that's definitely, when you go for your clinic visits beyond these drugs, you know, people take a pulse, I would hope, and look at that. Bleeding is also increased. Many of you, when you have a procedure, dental work, operation, you've got to stop these drugs before and after because of an increased risk of bleeding. Hypertension particularly with ibrutinib, by the way, was a big issue, is a big issue. Managed, it can be managed. Uh, an infection, I'm a little surprised, but it is, you know, it's quite higher, actually. There you go. Brilliant drug. And the other thing that's very, very good at is in people who do have a mutated P53 gene. Remember that 1 in 20,000? If it has gone bad, patients are doing really well with these t groups, the treatment. So, what can we say about BTKI drugs? Use a lot of ibrutinib over time. Don't use it so much now because it's not really so accessible as first-line therapy. Acalabrutinib has got a broader access for financially in the UK. And also, as we'll look at later, acalabrutinib is seems to be lower risk of hypertension and atrial fibrillation. And they're both equally effective. Yeah? So, very good treatments. Used every day until disease progression. There are studies, as you know, some of you may be involved in it, we're trying to stop the drug in, in, in trials. I'm not going to talk about that today, but that's in assessment. But generally, well tolerated, all those slightly issues with bleeding, as we said, potential atrial fibrillation. Venetoclax is first-line therapy. Venetoclax is very different. It's fixed duration, one year, and um, it's given with an antibody, abinutuzumab. Many of you know about rituximab. You know, that, that was the classic antibody in the last 20 years against B-cells. It's transformed hematology. This is a next generation rituximab. It seems to be a bit better. And so it's used with venetoclax. This is the study. They compared it against chlorambucil. And, you know, you can see it's one year, so the treatment stops there. 
and you can see a slight drop off but this is only three year follow up. It's now been followed up to five years and I think 63% of people have not progressed after five years despite only having one year of treatment. Very, very good. Very good. Some debate whether it's not quite so good against people with the mutation, but we're not sure if that's so important, but some suggestion it might be down to 40% of the mutation. It's a super, super agent. I'm not going to go through all the management of venetoclax. You know, you have to be very careful when you start it. Some of you may have been through this. You have to ramp up the tablets very slowly. And um, that's because, and I say to patients, it's ironic. That's not the reason that, because it is so good. It kills the tumour so well. It clears out this BCL2 protein so well that you can get rapid death of the tumour cells. Lymph nodes shrink, and that can be, it's just a problem to clear all the toxic side effects. So it's ironic that in the early days of this treatment with these sort of drugs, the people, unfortunately, there were deaths because the treatment just killed off too many cells and they couldn't be flushed out quickly enough. Now, when managed properly, that's not a serious problem. Now, this is a slide I inherited from somebody else. I don't think I want to go through it because I'm not sure I know all the data confident enough. But basically, it says they're all pretty much the same. Yeah, this is ibrutinib for those people who are on that. It's been going for a long, long time now. Really good. Um, venetoclax with a bonutizumab. This is a calibrutinib, and this is the limit. And you look, five years, 70% progression-free survival, 74%, 72%, I said 63%. They're all the same. They're all the same. They're all very good. But... As far as we know, we haven't had them for that long, we're not yet seeing that plateau. We don't think it's a cure. Yeah? So it's extending response, but eventually you may come to need something else. And there you go. They, they appear to be excellent, but they're not a cure. And what's the treatment? And I've summarized, this is my words, not the IWCS live guidelines. Basically, we swap to the other, usually usually swap for the other yeah because you've got two options this is what you're officially supposed to do choice of second line agent btki if you've had ibrutinib of something okay well they've swapped you to venetoclax um, this line btki venetoclax or venetoclax on its own v venetoclax first BTK and so forth. I think that's basically what they've done. The only thing I would say is BT BTKIs only tend to be used once. That may change because we're getting a new generation of them which can maybe work again in a different way. Whereas venetoclax you often can have retreatment with it. Yeah, because it's, it's fixed, it's one year, and if you do well, but then you start to relapse again after two or three years, you can have it again, potentially. Yeah? So that is something else um, that's in the mix. Here's some examples. This is historical of interest. This was Resonate, which is Ibrutinib. This goes back 10 years or more. Split of the curves versus chemo is remarkable, and the survival is remarkable. This is the um, acalabrutinib. This is quite an interesting study because it compared BTKs head to head. Abrutinib, the old war horse, versus acalabrutinib. And it was really designed in relapse to see how these people compared. And you can see there's nothing to choose between them clinically in terms of their cancer effect. They are equivalent. That's survival. Yeah? 
But what they did find in this study is if you looked at the rate of atrial fibrillation, it's higher with ibrutinib versus acal ibrutinib. I mean, you might say, if you get to that point, it's not so enormous, is it? But statistically, um, it was slightly higher. And therefore, hypertension seems to be lower as well with acalabrutinib, and that's one reason it tends to get used quite a lot. And the summary of that was head-to-head, -head, no difference, fewer cardiovascular. And so it tends to be used rather than ibrutinib in the relapse setting. Venetoclax, unlike first line, it's slightly different. It's two years, and it's with rituximab different antibody, because the clinical trials used it in that way. And this is this famous Murano study. And you're now seeing, you know, five-year survival, median progression-free survival, sorry, is, is, is very, very good. Five years is 60 months, isn't it? So that's about four and a half years on average. This is relapse therapy. Um, two years treatment. And it's very, very good. And, and you can see five-year survival rates very, very good as well. Is there still a role for stem cell bone marrow transplantation? It does appear in these guidelines. And it's particularly for people who do have this mutation and have had one treatment and are now on their second. Yeah? So you probably would just think at least perhaps get them to talk to a transplant doctor in case the second line treatment doesn't work so well. But you know the problem with a transplant, it can be great, it can be curative, short term but intensive, but the bad is it's a big risk. You know, morbidity, mortality, and it doesn't always work, and patients can relapse. And then you come down to the bottom, where are things going? Um, new treatments, but basically that is the guideline. It's helped me actually doing this talk and trying to work my way through it and um, I think on the whole it's, it's very good and as I say to patients, you know the treatment for CLL in the UK is as good as anywhere in the world. You know, I mean you'd expect that, you'd, you'd want that, you'd expect it and I believe it to be entirely true. Definitely. Where do we go in the future? You know what doctors are like. They're always looking to the next clinical trial, next patient, paper, publish things, pushing forward. They've got to put the two together. I mean, if you've got two great drugs, well, let's put them together. And there's a lot of interest in this. I, I'm not following the treatment. You know, I don't know a great deal about this. This is one example called the GLOW study. Um... Uh, this is the Gaia study, sorry, um, CLL-13, look what they've got, chemotherapy, venetoclax with a tuxalab, and they, here they put ibrutinib and venetoclax and avinutuzumab. So you've got your venetoclax therapy, and they've added on ibrutinib, fixed duration, yeah, not for, not. Now how does it look? It's in purple, progression-free survival seems pretty good. These are your mutation genes, remember? Unmutated, not so good, but with this the treatment, it's pretty good, right? This is venetoclax, it's also very good. Unmutated, also very good. You can't really separate them, actually. We can get venetoclax now. That's, that's what we can use. So it's not, I wouldn't say it's dramatically better. I must say, right at the start, I was talking about mutated genes and how important they were because they sorted people into good and bad, yeah? But I also said, actually, these days, I'm not so sure how important that is. And when I look down this line at these two purples, I think that's pretty true, right? It's getting less and less important because our treatments are improving. Overall survival, brilliant. And then we're getting new drugs. This is a Xanobrutinib. This is another BTK drug, new type. Doesn't stick quite so in the same way 
to the um, BTK pi protein. And this actually only came out, I think, in November last month. It was a trial of xenobrutinib versus ibrutinib. So, uh, you know, good trial, direct head to head. Xano versus ibrutinib in relapsed disease. The Alpine study. It's available online if you want to look. And it did show that Xano gives a superior response in improved progression free survival as well as less heart disease. So it looks like this could be less cardiotoxic and more effective. So this will be something that will be assessed in terms of therapy. It might displace ibrutinib, and of course then it will have to be assessed against acalibrutinib. So we've got a whole lot of new things coming through. So the treatment landscape for CLL is focusing down on these two big agents. Venetoclax tends to go with an antibody. Maybe we'll use all three together for newly diagnosed and relapsed. I think last time I gave a talk, we were still considering chemotherapy and newly diagnosed, but not a relapse. Now it's rarely given for either. Optimal choice depends on patient-specific factors, discussions, and so forth. Future developments will include new drugs, combinations, time-limited therapies, Minimal residual disease, trying to eradicate all the disease. And I think one thing the last three years has shown us that don't forget optimization of supportive care, vaccinations, management of infections. But certainly the outlook for CLL has been transformed. I've decided how many years to put on this one. I was right in this slide. I've put 10 years. I think that probably is about right since we had ibrutinib around. When I used to manage CLL in the early days, it used to be chlorambucil tablets, two, two milligrams a day or four milligrams a day, um, continuously actually. Uh, it wasn't good. So things have been transformed and um, you know, when we talk to patients now in the clinic, an early diagnosis, the old textbooks, some of which I did write, said the average survival of CLL used to say 10 years. Well, it's not that now, it's way beyond that. And I think we're increasing the vast majority of people. We're now trying to get essentially to a normal lifespan. Yeah, that's what we should be aiming for. Um, and I think in most people we can. I'm going to stop there. Thank you very much. Thank you.